Hey guys, this is Elliot the iPad Pro, and by the end of this tutorial, you'll have Jupyter Hub set up for your lab, classroom, or business. So what is Jupyter, and how is it actually useful? So the first thing to know is that Jupyter Hub is a website. It's a website where you do professional programming. Right when you set up Jupyter Hub, you'll be able to code in all of these different languages. Now when it was first created, Jupyter Hub was made for data scientists and researchers so that they could both write code and explain their data in one place. But you can do a lot more with it. Jupyter Hub makes it incredibly fast and easy to deploy professional looking applications. But if you used Jupyter before, you might be thinking, wait a second, isn't this just Jupyter? What makes Jupyter Hub special? Well, with regular Jupyter, one person is able to use the Jupyter website. But with Jupyter Hub, you now have that many people can use the Jupyter website. So if we go back to the Jupyter Hub home screen, you can see that we can log out. Now you can see the screen that anyone in your class or lab can use to sign into Jupyter Hub. And since Jupyter Hub is a website, people can do programming on whatever device they want. It doesn't matter if it's a Mac or a Chromebook or an iPad. In fact, in a previous video, I even show how you can do programming on a phone. But what really makes Jupyter Hub special is that everybody who uses it is connected with each other. For instance, with the Jupyter app IO Online, everybody in the lab has access to a newsfeed that automatically updates with what projects lab members are currently working on. You can instantly share your work on the newsfeed, and then everyone can check out your research or code. Another incredible app is NB Grader. So NB Grader makes it so that you can easily make homework assignments and then send them to all of the students. And then those homework assignments can be received by a deadline and then automatically graded for the entire class. As a TA, this software saved me weeks of work. Okay, so now if you think Jupyter Hub looks pretty useful, you're probably wondering what website you go to to sign in and set up your lab. But the thing is, you don't go to a website. Instead, you launch a website. And you might think, oh man, I have to launch a website? That'll take the IT team months to do. But it turns out it's actually really easy. You'll actually have everything set up by the end of this tutorial, and that's because of the new technology of cloud computing. So in this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to set up Jupyter Hub on a Google Cloud so that everybody in your lab can do their programming in one place. So the first step is to create a Google Cloud account, which you can do at cloud.google.com. Then click Try Free. You get $300 worth of Google credits, which should last your lab or classroom about two to four months, depending on how much you use it. When you finish creating your account, you'll come to the Google Cloud home screen, which will look something like this. In the upper left-hand corner, you'll see the Options button. This shows you all the different things that Google Cloud can do. Google Cloud is insanely powerful. You can build an entire supercomputer from scratch. But in this tutorial, we'll just set up Jupyter Hub. The first thing to do is to scroll down to Container Registry, and then click it. Then click Images. Then click Enable Container Registry API. What this does is it allows you to launch a little pre-built computer in a box, which has all of the Jupyter software already on it. Now we're going to create the computer that will run Jupyter Hub. To do this, click Options again, and scroll up until you see Kubernetes Engine. Then click Clusters. When Kubernetes has finished getting ready, click the Create Cluster button. This brings you to the place where you decide the size and settings of your computer. Let's name our computer my-first-io-hub. Now, your computer is going to be running inside a Google data center. And under Zone, you can decide the physical location of this computer. For this tutorial, let's choose US Central 1C. Node pools is where you decide how many CPUs your computer has and the size of its hard drive. Let's click Advanced Edit. 
Inside Edit Node Pool, some things might look familiar to you, like deciding how many CPUs or memory you want to use, or deciding the size of your computer's hard drive. But there's other things you may have never seen before, like deciding number of nodes or enabling auto-scaling. These are really special features, and it's stuff like this that makes cloud computing so much more powerful than any computer you can build. When you run JupyterHub, you're not launching one computer. Instead, what you're doing is making many small computers. Each of these computers has its own CPU and memory. Each of these computers is called a node, and number of nodes specifies how many computers there are in total. So in this case, there are three computers set up to handle all of the people who are using JupyterHub. Now let's say you're teaching a big class. You're probably going to need more than three computers for your JupyterHub. But if you think about it, there's certain times when you're going to need a lot of computers running, and other times when three might actually be enough. For instance, a lot of students might be using JupyterHub the day before homework is due, but almost no one is using it at 4 a.m. at night. To make JupyterHub cheap and to use it for a large class, you can use something called auto-scaling. With auto-scaling, you have a minimum number of computers, which might just be three nodes. But you can also set a maximum number of computers, which may be as many as you like. Okay, so how many nodes should you actually set up? Well, it depends. If this is only for like seven or eight people, then three nodes is probably enough. But if this is for a lab of like 25 people, then you might want to have 10 nodes. If this is for a class of 100 people, then you should probably have 20 nodes. And if this is for the entire university, then you should make that 200 at least. But if this is your first time and you're just trying the free trial, then let's just make it three nodes. The next thing that I would change is the computer's hard drive. I always use SSD drives because they run faster. If you're doing the free trial, then each hard drive can only have 32 gigs of space. Now, one tip is that if you click Enable Preemptible Nodes, your JupyterHub computer will be way cheaper, but it will also be more glitchy, so I don't really recommend this unless you're strapped for cash. Under Access Scopes, click Allow Full Access to All Cloud APIs. This gives students access to all of Google's cool features. Finally, under Kubernetes Labels, click Add Label and then type hub.jupyter.org slash node dash purpose. And then in the box next to it, type core. This makes it so that JupyterHub recognizes your node cluster. All right, then click save and create to launch your node cluster. It might take a few minutes for your computer to spin up. All right, our nodes are ready, and congratulations, you just created your first Kubernetes cluster. Now the cluster is there, but we still have to put the JupyterHub software on the cluster. But don't worry, I wrote some code on GitHub that makes setting up JupyterHub really easy. But real fast, what's GitHub? Well, you know how you can store files online using things like Dropbox, Google Drive, OneDrive, or iCloud? Well, GitHub is just another way to store files online. Well, what makes GitHub special is that you can store all your files for free. But there's one catch, and that's that if you want it to be free, then you have to make your files available to everybody else, which is perfect for programmers and academic researchers. So what we're going to do is download the code that I wrote on GitHub and use that to launch JupyterHub. So how do we do this? Well, first we connect to our computer by clicking the Connect button. Then, when you click Run in Cloud Shell, you'll gain access to Google Cloud's terminal. Let's make the terminal a little bigger. Then we press Enter to run the first command. Okay, now we're going to use the terminal to download my GitHub software. Type git clone https colon slash slash github dot com slash pupster nine o slash io underscore hub underscore setup. Press enter to download the software. You can see that it's downloaded by typing ls enter. To go inside of the folder, type cd io hub setup and then enter. Then type ls again to see what's there. You'll see an application called Start IOHub. To run this application, type period slash 
and then Start IOHub. Then press Enter. This program should install and run JupyterHub. If you get any errors that said something timed out, then just try running it again a little later. This is what the screen should look like when the program is done running. Once you see this, wait a few minutes and then type dot slash check IOHub.sh and press enter. You'll know that your computer is ready when you see a little number under external IP on the third line down. That weird number with dots is actually the name of your JupyterHub website. So let's go there and see what happens. So when you first go to the Jupyter website, you might get an error message because it takes about 10 to 20 minutes for the website to spin up. But eventually, when you come back to it, it will look like this. Now to create an account, just type your username and your password and then click sign in. The first time you do this, it might actually take a while, but after that, it will run really smoothly. And now you see that you have JupyterHub and that you can do programming in all of these languages. But this is kind of just the bare bones version of Jupyter. In IO, I created some really cool extra features, like a way to share work with other people in your lab, and a way to make notebooks look a lot more organized and prettier. To get IO set up, click Welcome to IOHub, and then click Welcome to IOHub. Now, just run the one cell that you see in the notebook, and then the installation for IO will appear. Then scroll down and click Start. This will install IO. Now when it's finished, you have to restart to see the changes. To do that, just go back to the main page and then click Control Panel, and then click Stop My Server. After that, you can log back into the server and see the new changes. So probably what you really want to see is some code to prove this works. So let's create something in Python and then share it with the lab. Since this is going to be shared with others, click Public. Now we're going to create a new folder. Click New and then click Folder. Let's rename our folder my underscore first underscore io. Now we'll go into the folder and finally start coding in Python. Choose Python 3 for your file type. As you can see, you can easily run simple Python commands. But you can do way more than that. For instance, you can organize your code using headings. And what's really cool is that these headings are collapsible, so it's a great way to hide and show code. So in IO, I tried to include all of the most important packages that you might like to use. But I'm sure there's going to be specific packages that your lab uses that I missed. But that's no big deal, because you can install them right from a Python notebook. And now you see you have the package. So you can put this setup for your entire lab in one notebook, and then you can call that My Labs Setup. And the really amazing thing is not only do you have that setup, but when you share this with your lab, everybody else can get that setup. So how do you share things with the lab? Well, for that, you go to IO Online. When you're on the homepage, click Apps, and then click IO Online. Open the Welcome to IO Online file. To see the IO Online application, click the Web button. Now, IO Online has a ton of amazing features, but in order to use them, you need to sign in to GitHub. So if you don't have a GitHub account, you can create one real fast at github.com. Now, when you use IO Online, you're really just using GitHub. But GitHub is kind of hard to learn, especially if you're not a professional programmer. And IO Online just makes everything simple and easy. Okay, so now let's sign in with our GitHub name and password. So you only have to sign in once, and then the application will remember you. Now, when I go back to the sections from before, all of a sudden, I can do things with the application. Probably the application you'll use the most is the IO Newsroom. Here you can see all of the different files that people have published. But right now, it shows all the files that everybody has published on IO. And probably at the start, all you want to see is the files for your lab. But all you have to do to set up your lab is decide the name of it. Let's call our lab Hans Lab. Now when we go back to the newsroom and refresh it, we'll only see the files from our lab. 
Right now we see nothing because no one has published anything, but how about we publish that file that gives everybody in the lab our lab's software setup. To do that, all we have to do is click Add for the My First IO folder. Now when we click Refresh, we'll see My First IO is there. And let's say later you make changes to your folder. If someone in your lab wants to see the folder My First IO, all they have to do is click Download. Then they'll see the folder inside of their downloads. And when they open the file, it will just instantly work. They can run the file instantly by clicking the web button. Now there's one last really amazing thing to show from this application. Let's say your student really liked your folder, My First IO. They liked it so much that they want to move it out of downloads and somewhere special, like apps. Now everything that is inside of your apps folder has a really special feature. These things are applications, and everybody in your lab will get updates when these applications get upgraded. So for instance, my lab setup is your application, and let's say you want to add another package for everybody to install. So you install the package on your computer, but how does everyone else install it on theirs? Well, first you publish your changes on IO Online so that everybody knows you made them. You can write a comment about what the change is. And then when they refresh their apps, they'll see that there's an update for your application. Then when they click Update, My First IO will instantly be updated to the newest version. This makes it really easy for everybody in the lab to stay up to date on the most important work that your lab is doing. Okay, so there's one last really incredible feature I want to show about IO Online, which is that it doesn't just allow everybody in your lab to stay up to date with you. It allows everybody in the world to stay up to date with your work. For instance, let's say you want to check out the latest things that Yemi's lab is doing. Well, to do that, you can just log out of your lab, and then you can type Yemi's lab. Now, when you go down to the newsroom and click Refresh, you'll see all the latest things that Yemi's lab has been working on. It looks like she just published a new amazing paper. If you want to check out what it is, you can click Download. So now you can see that IO Online isn't just a way for your lab to work together, it's a way for the entire academic community to work together. Okay, I think that's enough of a sales pitch. I hope you see that JupyterHub is a useful application for writing research, code, and sharing ideas. But before I go, there's actually one incredibly important thing, which is that we haven't finished setting up JupyterHub yet. So if you remember, when we logged into JupyterHub, we just created our username on the fly. Right now, any stranger can create an account and start using your computer, which is extremely unsafe. So you can make it so that only specific users can access your Jupyter Hub. I don't really have time to show you it in this tutorial, but I'll give you a brief overview right now. So remember when you downloaded my GitHub files that set up Jupyter Hub? Well, in those files, there's one specific file called config.yaml. This file decides all of the settings for your hub. If you actually plan to continue using JupyterHub, it's really important that you understand how this file works. That's why I added little web links to a really awesome Jupyter tutorial that explains how this file works. Now at the very bottom of the file, you'll see a section called Set Allowed Users that's all commented out. In this section, you'll see that there's two different ways to set up who's allowed to use your Jupyter Hub. I really recommend that you use the first way, with the whitelist, where you just manually add each user. Now you can also make it so that everyone with a certain type of email can use your Jupyter Hub, like at yourcompany.com. And I've done this, so it's definitely possible, but it's really involved. I at least gave some pointers to tutorials that helped me along the way, but I really recommend you use the whitelist. Also, on the main page of my GitHub folder, I'll also include some step-by-step -step instructions about how to set up the whitelist. You'll be able to find this at github.com slash pupster90 slash iohubsetup. Now, before I go, I think it's really important to think about the big picture. So what are the pros and cons of JupyterHub? Well, one of the things that makes JupyterHub so special is that you can have tons of users. 
Remember that on Google Cloud, we decide the size of our computer, so we can have hundreds of users, or even tens of thousands of people using JupyterHub. Another great thing is that it's really easy for students. From their perspective, they magically gain access to a website where they can program in any language on any device. And finally, all of this can be done really cheaply and efficiently. Remember that in Kubernetes, the number of computers grows and shrinks depending on how many people are using them. So even if there's thousands of users, there might be times when you're only paying for 10 computers. These things make JupyterHub really good for teaching. NBGrader is a golden example of how JupyterHub can be used to teach thousands of students computer science. Okay, now even if we don't want to, we have to look at the cons. First off, JupyterHub is kind of tricky for the people running it. The whole goal of this video was to make JupyterHub as easy as possible to set up, and it was still more involved than I'd like. If you're a lab of 10 or 20 people and none of you are professional computer scientists, then JupyterHub might be too annoying to set up and maintain. Another thing that I would find really annoying is that you're kind of limited in what you can do. For instance, let's say that I wanted to run a neural network in JupyterHub. Now that is actually possible, but I would have to wait for the person running JupyterHub to set it up for me. Now, even when I say there's cons, I still think JupyterHub is an absolutely magical piece of software that can change the way people program. I should also say that for small labs, I found a way to give everybody in your lab access to the full power of Google Cloud without having to type any code. If that's something you're interested in, contact me in the comments and I might do another video about it. Also, if you have ideas about how to make the software better, let me know on GitHub or YouTube. And finally, if you enjoyed this video, click like and subscribe. This is Elliot the iPad Pro. See you guys next video.